school. And that is not a typo. It's not Aaron Moore's last name. It's actually Moore. And of course, if you had been watching what was happening over here, uh, there were a number of us clustered because we were all at Columbia at the same time. Um, and so that's quite bizarre. I had no idea that Antonio Latini, who's coming to speak on Monday, is actually from my class. Karen, um, I'll tell you the rest of that at the end. Uh, <laughs> So, but it is my really great pleasure for uh, a thousand reasons, and uh, 999 will be at will be my my last line here. But uh, <laughs> Karen is a founding partner of Marvel Fairbanks, an architecture design and research office in New York City, and is the Anne Whit Whitney Olin Professor of Professional Practice and chair of the architecture department at Barnard College. Uh, Marvel Fairbanks actively pursues the use of new materials and techniques. <coughs> utilizing the latest developments in digital design and integrated production technologies. They've um, just completed the Tony Stabile Student Center for the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia University, and I was very <coughs> pleased to see it and um, to also, I think, um, be, be, be part of a larger structure at the AIA when it was actually awarded um, uh, an excellence award. Um, the Glen Oaks Branch Library, currently under construction in Queens, and Flat Form, a project commissioned by the Museum of Modern Art, looking at digitally designed assembly and architecture, which happens actually right now, for any of you who know that we're right, the AAA school is in New York at the Furniture Fair doing very similar kinds of work, Flat Form work, and has just received some kudos about that, so it'd be another connection. Uh, I have it. It's online because people are blogging about it. Uh, but we're going to talk about Karen Fairbanks right now. <laughs> uh, Marvel Fairbanks has received many, many awards, local, regional, national, and international awards. And it's, their work has been widely, widely published, um, including in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And um, their drawings have been exhibited as part of the museum's permanent collection. This is not an easy thing to, to get, believe me. Um, They've been awarded the AII Honor Award for the uh, Student Center at the Graduate School of Journalism. This is their 10th AIA award. Um, they have been uh, received citation awards by New York State, Best in Category Awards, Annual Design Awards by Architect Magazine. Uh, they are selected as the Michael Owen Jones Memorial Lectures at the University of Virginia and the Charles and Ray Ames Lectures at the University of Michigan. Their book, Marvel Fairbanks, Bootstrapping, was published on the occasion of that lecture and other awards include a four American Architecture Awards, a PA Award, an uh, Architecture Design Award for Emerging Architecture, and the 40 Under 40 Award. Yeah, when was that? No. <laughs> 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 Only that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As the department chair at Barnard, uh, Karen oversaw the merger of the Barnard and Columbia Architecture Programs and has developed the current department curriculum in the Digital Architecture Lab. She's been teaching design studios and courses on new technology since 89. And while at Barnard, she's participated in the capital planning on the camp of the campus of the Diana Center. And many of you know that project. Um, she received her Master of Architecture degree from Columbia and a Bachelor of Science in Architecture from the University of Michigan. She indeed was my roommate at the University of Columbia. I was the older roommate, I would say that. <laughs> and when I said that, when, when was that? It was really re reference to me. <laughs> Absolutely not to her. Um, so if people ask what were the stories, um, you know, I'm not going to tell you that. Um, but uh, it's really, um, it's been way too many years um, that we've waited to bring uh, Karen Fairbanks here to lecture. Her work is amazing, um, and her leadership at one of the premier universities in the country is, as well. With that, let me introduce oh, my dear friend, Karen Fairbanks. Thank you. Teachers, Tim Tice is here. Um, somebody who worked in my office, Jolie Kearns is here. It's great to to um, to be in Eugene, and I actually am. Oh, I think I'm supposed to put this thing on, right? Mm -hmm. cool. um, it's kind of ironic that I've come to the Pacific Northwest to dry out. Um, <laughs> it's been raining for weeks in New York. 
so that's, that's wonderful. Let me uh, grab this. Sorry. So this work is the work of many people in our office. Um, as I mentioned, Jolie's here. Um, who worked, I think, on um, one of our competitions. It's not a project I'll show tonight, but um, there is really a, a collaborative um, sense to the office, and those people, everybody in there plays a big role in that. Um, many collaborators in the field, many clients who share the vision um, for the project. So um, I just want to mention that this is a lot. My partner is Scott Marble um, of Marble Fairbanks, and he also went to Columbia and knows these people <laughs> in the room. <laughs> So as teachers and architects, being um, we've been very invested in the latest digital technologies, and I think that comes from just when we were at school and what was happening as we were starting to teach and the kinds of development were happening in the field at that time. Um, for us, the digital um, tools are interesting not just as techniques, but as um, a source of, of design inspiration. And uh, the projects that, that I'm going to show you are all research into how these digital processes can expand how we design. They're research into how we manage the increasing flow of information that we address and, and that is relevant to projects, and also how we effectively um, collaborate with our industry and beyond. Um, we're finding that as we're addressing more and more information that's available to probably to help define and assess the design options, we're also still really interested in how we make those other decisions, how we kind of intuit those design decisions. And so this relationship between quantitative information and qualitative design ideas are is something that I want to talk about in some of these projects. And we're also interested in more, more is up there for more, more information and more forms of collaboration. Collaboration um, with our design teams, um, but also collaboration with our industry partners, the, the fabricators and contractors we work with. So, with that, I think I'll introduce, I'm going to take you through four projects. And um, I think we're a small group. Feel free to chime in if there's something you want to ask along the way. Um, this first project is called Expanded Alliances, Industry and Beyond. And this is a project we did for the slide library, um, a slide library for the Department of Art History and Archaeology at Columbia University. Um, it's called Expanded Alliances, um, Industry and Beyond because of the way we decided to work, we were working with this expanded team, um, which was unusual for the campus. The, the site is a building on Columbia's uh, campus, um, it's called Skirmahorn, and it's in the upper floor. We were um, actually started working with the Department of Art, History, and Archaeology to do a planning study for their whole building, uh, or all their spaces in their building, and this project came from a study that said that they should decrease the size of their, of their library collections and reduce the, the, the amount of slides they're actually using they, and use that space, the larger space, for student center. So the space we were moving the slide library to was actually an interior space, um, right kind of landlocked, landlocked behind around a bunch of offices, which is here. So this space, we thought, was actually just a pretty simple landlocked space. Um, uh, that was going to be a pretty straightforward project. But um, it's at the end, and it's actually at the end of this long hallway. It had a real postmodern renovation in the 80s. The faculty were really excited to see something else happen there. Um, but a significant thing that happened as we started the project was the discovery of a skylight that had been hidden. Um, we were on the top floor of the building, and we found a skylight up to the roof. And at that point, this project transformed from being just a box for slides that was in the middle of a hallway to, to a space that actually could project light and interact with the kind of spaces around it in a, in a more very unique way. Um, what you're seeing here is how the form in the hallway actually bends back at the point um, under the skylight. So you're actually getting light from the skylight down into the hallway around the box. It's the slide library as well as inside the box. And here you're seeing that bulge from the inside. Um, so the project is, is about um, a relationship that was set up between the Department of Art, History, and Archaeology and the Department of Architecture, our office, the students, and a contractor on camp that um, was brought to campus. Um, 
when we discovered the skylight and realized this could become a very different kind of project, it actually coincided with my partner Scott being the, the head of the Digital Fabrication Lab at Columbia. And the Digital Fabrication Lab had a mandate to build full scale. And this was going to be a summer project. The lab was going to be quiet. So we decided to um, approach the university and ask the Department of Art History and Archaeology to hire the Graduate School of Architecture to help fabricate and assemble this project. That we designed it, but we had a whole team of students working with us to actually do all the fabrication and assembly. So part of what we were interested in here is this idea that there are so many places with architecture students on campus and so many campus projects that are short and, and um, summer long or short projects that are not that large a scale. Why couldn't we use that? Why couldn't we use these projects on campus as a teaching tool for our students? Um, of course, that's not so easy because then there's issues of liability and all this. So to do this, we actually had to go to even um, even the chief counsel of the university and, and work that out, work out the questions about liability and, and the work on site. But it was a, it was a, for us, it seemed pretty clear that that would be an amazing um, opportunity. The chair of the art history department was Barry Bergdahl, and the chair of the architecture schools um, was, is Mark Wig, was Mark Wigley at this time. So those two were very willing to, to take this path. Um, so the project became, in some ways, a kind of didactic teaching tool about digital fabrication. Um, what we did is we used, I didn't bring a pointer, and I didn't think I was going to need to point much. But what we did is we took the, the top wall that you saw images of before, the, the wood wall, is, is 435 pieces of medium density fiberboard. And those were all milled um, and, and um, layered to make that long wall. The, perimeter, other three walls, are actually walls where the pattern is, is the literal tooling paths of those 435 layers. So as you move around this, this space, if you move around this volume, you're actually seeing all the information that was used to cut those pieces of MDF as, in, as pattern for the rest of the walls and as a kind of design of the rest of the walls. This is, you know, kind of typical image of looking at those, all those MDF panels and the kind of nesting to get all the, the, um, the material cut efficiently, and then the layout of those around this, the perimeter. They had one three-axis mill. It was really tiny, in one tiny little room. So at some point, we actually expanded the team again and outsourced it. We had all the digital files. All we had to do was send them to another place to make our schedule, make our deadline. This is on those tooling paths, actually making that pattern on the perimeter wall. So here at the corner of the, build, of the room, basically, you're seeing how um, on one wall there's these, these um, carved MDF panels, and then around the rest of the space are these pattern, pattern surfaces. The interior effect of those, just those lines, was quite beautiful and pretty luminous. We were working with light coming from around the perimeter, light was coming in in a way we didn't really expect as much, which is through the faculty offices. As they opened their doors into the hallway, all of a sudden this room would burst with light. Um, the, the panel system here is just uh, plywood with forbo on one side and plastic laminate of a yellow-green color on the other side. And it's a couple inches and then a translucent glass. So it kind of blurs the lines on the interior. And of course, working full scale let us fabricate all sorts of prototypes. We prototyped every piece of this. And we actually made the project as complicated as we could to test how this would work, to make it a real learning experience for everybody. So things that would have been easier just to buy, we made. And of course, project, you know, managing the materials becomes part of the process. And in this case, we failed miserably. I don't think you can see it, but we ended up having to write with a Sharpie all the numbers that were supposed to have been laser cut in. <laughs> to organize it. But it is even the material management of a project of this size is important to think about in a small space. This is, shows you how the project was put together. There are just um, staggered 18-inch long threaded rods that were connected with threaded couplings and um, a track at the top and the bottom. So we were just sliding these panels on and slipping these pieces of glass that were held by compression. Well, at first they were held by compression. <laughs> um, this is the students um, putting this putting the wall together. This long wall happened in, in a week. 
um, they, we did, it, it, most of the glass stayed fine. The glass that was on the panels that were starting to bow, that bends back a little bit, started to slip as the wall started to breathe. So we had to put a little silicone in for the, those glass pieces. Um, as I mentioned, this was about a, do, a different type of organization where the professional side and the academic side was kind of a, a gradient where people were kind of working on both sides of that line and, and the um, fabricators and the assembly team were students who were working from, <coughs> from one side to the other. So I think it was, it was a pretty interesting and unique experience for the campus to actually have the students building one of their campus projects. We, we were, this was a place for slides. So part of the image of this, of this um, volume was about this idea of projecting light through these little slots. And um, this is a view where you can kind of see how that skylight kind of lights the interior. So we also thought, thought of this room or this volume as, it's, as a projector to the space around it. And then, as I mentioned, there were certain effects that we didn't actually even think about as much. We thought always about light coming from this space out to the perimeter offices and enlivening the hallway. But as the lights were going down in the space, we started to realize the light from outside coming in was also quite nice. Um, as I mentioned, this is Barry. He's standing in front of the wall. This is Barry Bergdahl. He's now the chief. Uh, <laughs> he was, this was like one of his press photos. <laughs> we liked that. It didn't say anything about us, though. Um, but he then went to the Museum of Modern Art, where he's the chief curator of architecture and design at Museum of Modern Art. And so his first show was called Home Delivery, Fabricating the Modern Dwelling. And it was about uh, manufactured housing and um, prefabrication. It was a show where he had three different kind of parts to it. There were these full-scale houses built down in, the, um, in a lot next to, the, next to MoMA, if some of you saw that. There, were, um, there was a really great amount of historical information about um, fabrication and, and manufacturing. And then he asked three teams to do wall fragments that would kind of t look at the potential of future digital fabrication. So this was our piece. Um, there were a lot of things we were interested in. Um, partly, though, we had, we had been working a lot in metal and, in, and perforated and laser cut metal. And in this case, we wanted to see what else we could do with that, um, use, starting with metal as a, as a material. This is uh, stainless steel. Um, there's always this interest in, in kind of the potential, I'd say, that comes, I think, from Slide Library 2. You're working in real materials, but you're drawing in, in um, these kind of forms of abstract representation. We were interested in carrying that idea forward as well. Um, in this case, there are two sheets of metal two sheets of stainless steel that together form a kind of um, structure and surface. It became more or less just a, a screen at this point, um, a, a kind of wall fragment screen. The project started with a lot of paper studies of looking at just ways to connect two sheets of material. We, so we had to set parameters ourselves. There were no givens besides that it had to be an experiment. <laughs> A research project. So our, our, the givens we gave ourselves, we started to work with metal, we wanted to work with flat materials and think about how flat materials could be expanded into something, some form of structure. When we started to work with the paper, we started to realize that the tab would be critical. The tab that would connect these two pieces would be critical. Um, we immediately got our um, a Maloya laser, a metal fabrication shop on board to do prototypes with us along the process. So this is a look at a lot of the different tab connections we started to study. And we realized, too, that as you're, as you're figuring out how to cut the tab, the tab is actually making the pattern on the screen. It's making the, the, the pattern. So we're also studying those patterns, those, those, um, what, what happens when we use, make tabs in different ways. This was a moment in the office when we weren't sure <laughs> <laughs> this was all going to work. We had, we had, were laser cutting some of these panels, and we were thinking that we were going to build this out of quite small pieces, like a jigsaw puzzle. And what we realized at this moment was that we, hadn't ha we didn't have enough overlap in our panels, in our pieces. And we were, we were studying like, what we were going to do with this. Um, it, you know, we, were we were hanging pieces in the office to see how they would hang. We knew we were going to suspend it. 
um, in the museum. We had decided that. Uh, this whole process was very fluid. We're working with materials. We're working with the museum to figure out where they're going to be sited. We're planning, you know, we're, we're strategizing the scale. We're working with, with the fabricator. So this is our final piece. You're seeing through the layers here. Actually, you're seeing the panel. What we did decide to do is paint the interior of just one of those two pieces of stainless steel. The color you're seeing here is actually reflected light. It's reflected color from the panel on the opposite side which is a really amazing effect. Um, as I mentioned, the geometry of the tab actually begins to control the entire structure. Um, and the point at which the tab connected became a kind of control point. So we had dimensions that were given based on the, the, the distance between the two pieces of steel, because those steel were, pieces were going to be bent and tabbed and connected. But we had other dimensions in the tabbing that were variables. And those had to do with what type of visual effect we wanted in this screen. Um, this animation shows you how those two pieces of metal get folded, the tabs get bent, and then folded into each other, and then locked into place um, and connected. So they give a kind of sense of how that was all put together. So we, we and this, this, kind of like the slide library, we found ourselves on this path where there was a lot of hand involved in the making of this very digitally driven thing. Um, these are some other uh, studies of just the tabs, how they would start to um, perform better in certain orientations and rotations. We had to rotate the tabs to get a good structural connection across the whole surface. Um, Again, setting the different patterns. And this is the actual installation. So we have a lot of tabs we had to fold. Um, you're going to see a little at the bottom left an animation over time. In the couple of days that we were in the museum, the top left you're seeing on the right side of that image, the, the sheets of metal flat. There's a table where we're bending them. Um, and then you're seeing them hung on a temporary frame. That's all in the top left image. The bottom left, you're seeing the animation over time, or the video um, over time of us putting, hanging this thing. We had to hang it on a temporary frame and then move it to its location in the museum and then transfer its weight from the frame to its new cable structure and then um, remove, the, remove the frame magically in that site. This is the process of sliding it in. And we're, we've now transferred it over, and we're moving the temporary frame away, and it's hanging in the museum. On the right, we had to make a brake press, <laughs> which is, you know, people from the office standing on tables with pieces of wood to bend, bend these panels along the bend lines. So again, I think it's, it's interesting that it's this, all, all this digital fabrication, yet what we, we found ourselves doing with these smaller projects was putting a lot of people and a lot of time and a lot of labor into making these things. So again, this is the piece. I mentioned the drawing, uh, the relationship between drawing and, and the final uh, form in the fabrication process. The ends of this were left flat and not folded out. We were kind of interested in, in this as, in a way, just a drawing of the project again, like, like the slide library, that there's information in the panel about how you assemble the panel. And that information is like a drawing until it's folded and it becomes a form. And finally, again, this is just reflected color and views through. So this is a project that Francis mentioned. Um, that um, she, she had seen through the uh, AIA awards um, panels. This is the Tony Stabile Student Center at the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia University. So another project at Columbia. We've been um, doing a lot of educational work and institutional projects. The educational work is really interesting, not, not just to have great, um, well, interesting for a couple of reasons. One is that the clients that you're working with are educators and people involved in education and really committed to having very interesting discussions about what the future is of education. In this case, working with, the, with journalists and think, thinking about where is journalism going in five years. So we started with a planning study for their building. It's about 80,000 square foot building. It's the building, um, if you have been to Columbia, this big, this is College Walk at 160. This is Broadway. This is the journalism building. This is an adjacent building called Fernald. And this is a gap between the buildings, which is part of the McKim campus plan that has these little slots. 
so we immediately wanted to grab that slot as part of our space um, for this first project out of the master plan. Um, the project takes is about 10,000 square feet. It takes 9,000 square feet inside the building and then this little, this little slot between the two buildings as a space for a way for the journalism school to connect to the broader community. Um, and this is an image of, of that um, little, little slot as, as the cafe it is now, part of this project. So again, there's a, a program inside and this little, this little piece on the outside um, that makes up the student center. What's interesting, I think any student center at any school is going to be different because of the pieces that actually are assembled around it to make it have the kind of synergies and the vibrancy of the life of that place. So in this case, in our study, there was a lot of back and forth about what would be the programs that would make this place really work as a student center. So it's got a, a very open social hub space. It's got the cafe. It's got the, we moved the library piece close to it. There's some student activity deans nearby. It had news um, uh, interview stations for the journalism students and some classrooms. So all this is all wrapping around each other in section. And just a quick section cut through the project, just showing you that on the multiple levels, all these types of spaces are are all connected to the social hub in the, in the cafe space that really drive the program. Um, the, but the design was actually driven by thinking about four main surfaces or zones in the building that would start to inform the design and also start to inform how we formed a larger collaborative team. So zone one is a, um, a ceiling that's a, really about a, in a kind of acoustic performance in the space, and that's the, the top the top ceiling piece up at the top there. Zone two or surface two is about a kind of a cultural performance, we called it. This surface here is about an environmental performance, and this surface here, we call it a, di a dynamic performance. For each of these surfaces, we actually expanded our design team and brought in other collaborators to work with us on them. This first surface, we were working with a small group who just graduated from Columbia called Proxy. And they did a lot of the um, scripting and um, studies at using um, Ecotech, Processing, Rhino to help us develop this acoustic ceiling. Um, this is a view of the social hub space, your, the ceiling above, um, and uh, that's a, actually a felt wall in the background. We were designing a space that had to accommodate a lot of different changing activities. So the acoustics had to work well for small groups to be there, but also a large group to meet and have a presentation. Um, the initial studies were looking at um, looking at the uh, an acoustic model to determine points that would be most beneficial to um, have more absorption in the ceiling surface, and then we were actually running th with um, processing running a script. What was interesting to us here is there was we could get quantitative information about what points and how much absorption we needed. But the design of that, to go back again, but the design of that could take multiple forms. We knew how much information, we knew where it was best to have the absorption, but how do you pick out of all those patterns? All those patterns actually solve the same problem. So you had to, p at some point you have to choose. Um, and this is where I was talking about this this idea of the difference between quantitative decisions and qualitative decisions. At some point, we had a hundred and some um, options for the ceiling, all of which would have performed um, the same in, to some extent. They were all about the same amount of, of um, opacity and um, absorption in the ceiling. Um, after scripting for that, we also had to run scripts to then set up and, and take care of all the installation, the geometry, the coordination of the hanging of the, of the panels. So that's a whole, a, another layer of information that had to go on once we, once we selected a design. This is actually the, the ceiling unfolded and, and some of the drawings of it um, as we were getting ready to prepare for fabrication, and then again out at our friends in the Loya Laser doing the full-scale prototypes and mock-ups and testing. And this is how it's hung. It's quite simple. It's just, it's just screwed into black iron in the ceiling, um, hung for a pretty standard way. And we've done this on a couple of projects. There it is complete. So we call that a kind of surface one or a zone that's about this acoustic performance. 
our second zone or surface in the space was about a cultural performance. And in this case, this is this, the wall, this, this uh, blue at the bottom left is the wall that you see as you enter the social hub. And when talking to the dean, that was a really important wall. It's a wall you see first as you're walking into his new student center. What would that wall be? And so we had lots of, we, in this case, we worked with a graphic designer, Luke Bullman and Thumb. And we had lots of discussions about the possibilities for what pattern that could be and what, what type of surface that could be. And in the end, decided that what was really interesting about journalists is that they're constantly moving outside of the building to do their work and come back. So we, we treated this as a surface of a different, a new kind of transparency through this image. Um, we took a photograph of the building across the street and actually turned that into the surface of our wall. So when you're inside, that pattern kind of begins to align and connect with the image through the windows of the building across the street. So it, it kind of virtually disappears into the context. Part of working with these different teams on these different surfaces is we had to set up rules, how each team would meet. So we were meeting with each team separately, but we were also meeting as a group and, and comparing rules, creating kind of alphabets and languages for our perforation patterns, for the spacing of those. And here you're seeing, again, and also testing fabrication. Like, can we see this pattern at certain distances? When will it come into registration? And some views of that. And then the third surface was about a kind of environmental performance. This is a surface in the cafe. The cafe was, had a glass ceiling and a glass wall. And this, this um, ceiling, this corrugated ceiling is hung below the glass. We wanted the effect of being like under trees in that slot, in that space. So the space in the site was modeled. Um, in this case, we were working with students from the Stevens Institute of Technology, who they have a really interesting program where their students are teamed up with architects and engineers around the city to do real projects and join project teams. So we had a group of students from Stevens working on this piece with us. And they did the modeling and um, helped write the scripts and do the studies for this corrugated ceiling that would we wanted to reduce the direct heat, or the direct sun by 80% in the space. So through a series of, of studies of corrugation patterns that would um, allow only indirect light, bounce light into the space, um, we started to develop a kind of um, a system of, of, of corrugations. And this is one of their scripts in Rhino, um, working in Rhino to set that up, setting up the variables, the parameters. We were interested in the corrugation having a certain type of effect, changing the number of corrugations in each panel as you move back through the, um, through the cafe. They change from being deeper in the front to shallower in the back. So you're seeing them kind of model this. So we were, again, having a separate process with this team working with their own set of variables and, and relationships, but also still trying to tie that back into the entire team's work. And that's the section of the corrugation at the top. And again, there was information that we got about how much um, corrugation and how much um, porosity and how much transparency we could have in the panel. But the question still is, what's the pattern of that? Or what does that look like? If we wanted to reduce this by 80%, there were many solutions to do that. We knew that in certain places, we had to have a certain amount of, um, of solid panel for the, to make those um, corrugations work well and to bounce light in. But we could do the perforation to control that in, in lots of ways. So we decided, um, the team decided to use the image of a clouds. And so you took, we took a photograph of clouds and actually put a satellite in it and then turned that into the corrugation, the perforation pattern for the panels. And you're seeing those unfolded on the right. So when you stand in the space, you don't necessarily see this image, but that was how we chose to drive that. And again, you're looking at mock-ups of that and then the final, the final space. And of course, having to think about things like how is it really installed? How do you hang? How do you access um, the ceiling afterwards? The lights, the glass. And the fourth panel, the fourth surface was about um, a dynamic performance. And in this case, we were working with front um, um, engineers in New York City that do a lot of work with um, glass and. Um, we also worked. They had fabricators that we teamed up with in Argentina. So this 
big glass wall that is in the front of the building is 19 feet long and almost nine feet tall. It's one piece of glass and it lifts up as one piece up behind a second piece of glass that same size. It's that static. So you're seeing the mock-up, this or the you're seeing the actual piece. This is this was fabricated in Argentina and the glass came from China. It's a pretty simple concept. There's um, screw jacks on either side and just a motor in the middle and axles driving those things. So both sides takes about four and a half minutes for this piece of glass to lift up. It's an event itself in the school. And here it is. So this idea, what we were able to accomplish here with the cafe was a way for the journalism school to be connected to the university and have that be a very fluid and open connection. Nice weather and this is open all the time. It's, it's up a lot. Um, it's a very popular space. And the bottom right, you'll see the four and a half minute sped up um, event of opening the glass wall. We found <laughs> people start slipping under it as soon as they possibly can, but it, it happens every day. It goes up <laughs> and then comes back down. There's, there's obviously a lot of um, built in safety mechanisms, so it, it can't come down on somebody. <laughs> um, it's five tons. So it's a lot to move that, but it's actually quite a simple uh, mechanism that does this. We were surprised one day to find that our piece had almost disappeared. We didn't realize as we came around the corner that this thing actually had this much reflectivity until this, this light hit it in a certain way one day. And again, this was really, as I mentioned, about a, a very large expanded team. We're a small office, but we brought in four different consultants to work with us of all different ranges and skills from recently graduated students to current students to people have done amazing technology and all over the world and um, kind of formed this really unique team where, as I said, you worked into with each team separately, but we had to come up with group rules about how all this would tie together and connect and how the team, so all the digital models were shared, all those rules were starting to evolve from all, all teams into making one kind of um, combined project. So the last project I wanted to present is this project for the Glen Oaks Branch Library. And this one's under construction in Queens. Um, this one is for the Department of Design and Construction in New York City. And so it's a public project, which has its own set of issues. It's been five or six years since we started this project. It went on hold for a year. It's taking forever in construction. Uh, but an incredibly rewarding project just because it is this um, really going to be this great new library for a community that really <clears throat> um, is excited about it. So Qu Queens uh, is a very diverse borough, one of, I guess the most diverse, uh, ethnically diverse borough of, Man of New York City. Um, Glen Oaks, where this library is, is it's as if Queens had a little extra bulge at the top that connected, that's like about as far away as you can get. That's on the upper uh, left. It's right at the edge of Nassau County. It's the beginning of Long Island. And you're seeing our site, which is at an interesting corner between a pretty um, big thoroughfare and small residential streets. One of the things we were interested in is how this building would have to address the identity of both the street and the, the urban thoroughfare and how it would sit into that site. These homes along here are really nice clear, uh, clean front yards, very manicured lawns. Some of them had really nice gardens. So we're really interested in that dimension of their, of their uh, open space in front of their houses, kind of being continued up into the site and then making a kind of uh, gesture toward the urban uh, scale on the other side. Um, the problem is that they really wanted about three times, double the square footage than we can actually have on this site by, zone, by zoning laws. So what we ended up doing is, I'm going to go back maybe and play that again. Um, can you play? What we ended up doing is putting a significant piece of this program underground to accommodate this, to deal with the scale and the zoning that was available on this site. So that is how we get, that's how we ended up with the form of the final form of the library. Two stories above ground in a very large underground reading room, which is under basically a, a green roof, a plaza here, 
this is a landscape space. Um, this is a big skylight that you kind of cross as you enter. And there's other smaller skylights in this plaza as well. Uh, we have to work with scape for landscape architecture. Um, and the, the, whole, the design of the landscape is really beautiful bluestone pavers that are set in kind of loose with an idea that they actually could be moved around over time and the, that the whole gardening and landscape could change over time. This is a section, cross section through the model. We actually, this, this project is done entirely in um, Revit and BIM software and we couldn't convince the Department of Design and Construction to, to require the contractors to use um, BIM, but we have given the contractors a, a read-only model at the site and they've just it's saved us so much time and and work to have that available so that they can show all the subcontractors in three dimensions everything all how all the materials come together it's a very um, heavy bin model we've got a lot of information in it we've tagged everything to its spec and and um, you can pull everything out of the detail so it's it's pretty it's pretty amazing resource these are sections cut. This section's cut the long way. You're seeing on the left the skylight down from the plaza, and then in the middle there the two big skylights coming down from that green space as well. So this underground reading room is actually, we see it as, as a different kind of landscape in a way. And if you take the section cut a little bit further in, you're seeing through the stair that connects that main street level space to that lower level. Um, the library's three floors where you enter and you go up to the children's level. They're the, the big window to the street up high. Um, the main floor is the teens and the lower level is the adult reading room. And even the landscape on the ground of the street level is kind of reflected then in the ceiling of the lower level. And it's a view of that. The skylights in that ground come down and kind of twist bring light down in an interesting way. We were, uh, the word search is actually a projection through just daylight onto the facade of the building. It's something that connects this project to its site through light, actually, and would change over time. Um, there's a parapet in the front of the building that has you know, this, this glass here is translucent glass and it's clear glass from here down. So the word search projects onto this translucent glass, it's this zone. That's the back of the parapet, which is south facing, and that has glass in it. And the word search is, is left as a void and a kind of film on that thing. So you see the word search is actually just letters projected by the sun over time on this, on this facade. So if it's a sunny day, you might see it. If it's summer, or winter, um, I don't think the animation's running. Uh oh, I think I lost that connection. The, um, the movie that was going to play is basically what's showing here that the word comes down and swoops across that top piece and it stretches a little bit longer in the summer, it's a little bit narrower in the winter. And as I said, if it was a cloudy day, you wouldn't see it. And if it's a sunny day, you would. So it's a way to connect the building. To the, um, to the neighborhood and to its site in a kind of unique way. Um, this is where we're at. <laughs> Actually, it's a couple weeks old, but we're in construction six years later, still trying. <laughs> and this, this view, I think, is kind of interesting because you're seeing down the street, um, you're just getting a glimpse of how that building sets back and ties into the scale of the neighboring buildings. And um, the neighborhood, as I mentioned, Queens is diverse, but Glen Oaks is incredibly diverse. Glen Oaks alone, for about 12 or 14,000 people, has about 28 languages spoken. So we're really interested in how um, this building could reflect its, um, the demographics of the site. So this lower level glass needed to have a f um, some type of film on it uh, to, to reduce the, the sun in the space and also to, to start to, to mask some of the section up at the top. So um, early studies, we were working with Stefan Sagmeister, a, a graphic designer, and had ideas about a film that would start to reflect um, the languages spoken in the neighborhood and start to read as if it was a pattern of books. Um, we started to develop that um, by 
cataloging all the different languages spoken and trying to and then translating the word search into each language and creating a pattern that would um, read from a distance at one scale as if it's just books on a shelf. But as, if you were to move up close, you would start to see that those lines actually were related to um, the languages spoken and that occasionally the language that was spoken would be, or a language that's spoken would actually be translated into this word uh, as a pattern on the, on the, um, on the facade. And in this case, we were working using Grasshopper as a way to begin to, to figure out how to, how to place that length, how to uh, create a pattern that would give us the visual effects we were after, but also allow us to kind of quantify this so that if you really were to dig into the abstraction, this information actually meant something. In this case, we were just changing the, um, the variables and the definition, the sliders, to allow for more dense or less dense readings, and it would re reorganize all the information. So in the end, what we were after is a place where you could walk around the building and actually see your language spoken um, at, and see that written on the, on the side of the library. I think it was interesting, I was talking to a, a person at Barnard who I work with who does translation studies and says that a language dies every two weeks. I think it's phenomenal. So this idea that you could actually mark in time the languages that are spoken at this site and have that be there um, as a kind of record, I think it's pretty interesting to us. And with that, I'll end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you talked a lot about um, kind of collaborating with, with um, especially when you do sort of digital fabrication. And I thought maybe you could talk a little bit more about how that changes what was a more linear process for design when you sort of hand over a, a set of CDs to a contractor um, versus what is, I think, a little bit more of a kind of feedback loop. Right. Well, I think that almost all the projects, like the DDC project, we don't have that. We aren't, we aren't really at that same level of, of collaboration um, with fabricators. But in the slide library and platform and the journalism project, we had already built up, in some cases, we'd already built up a relationship with people who are doing the fabrication. So the idea that you could, and then in the slide library, we had the tools to do the fabrication and prototyping. So the idea that you could work with these people as you're designing and test and get those, those, if we think about the platform, we're doing those tab tests. We could tell, you know, we knew what, what material we wanted to work with. We were still testing gauge of material. Um, with the fabricators, we were able to go back and forth on that. We could, by, chain, by testing the tabs and getting those to look at full scale, we were able to see structurally if they're working or not. I mean, it totally changed how we, how we worked. And it totally, by having them available along the way, our design process was much more iterative from, from design to fabrication and back. It was much more of a feedback loop. Um, we don't have the same kind of luxury at the DDC, and it has to do with the structure of how we're working on a public project, where you, don't, you, don't, you just don't have that kind of relationship with the contractors. I mean, this, it, public projects are really complicated, starting to change, but in New York City, that project doesn't even have a general contractor. There's a, something called Wix Law, which means that that project has four different contractors equally holding pieces of the project, none of whom have to talk to each other. The mechanical guy has his own contract. The electrical guy has his own contract. These are guys, I would, but anybody. <laughs> um, there is a general architectural contract, and there's a plumbing contract. There's nobody who has to oversee these people. So you not you can't. It's so hard to have a dialogue in a, in a kind of in a sense that you're working as a team, you know, on those projects. The BIM model's helping a little bit, but where wherever we can, and we've been able to do this on many many projects. If we can have that kind of relationship with uh, the fabricators and the people building and making these things, then we turn this as much as possible into a kind of research, a team research project. Um, but it completely changes that. I don't know.
know if you guys, do you guys have those opportunities here? Are you working, like making things full scale and testing that and bringing that back into your own design work? Or have you had that opportunity in design build or in a firm you've worked for? I mean, it, it does completely change how you think about making something. Right. Why did you choose that one? <laughs> this is what I'm saying. It's very tricky. When you have all this information and you have all these options, how do you choose? In that case, it had to do with, I mean, the patterns range from something that, um, where the figure of the zone where we wanted more intense um, absorb, sound absorption was very clear to something that was very, very dispersed. I mean, that was, there was a range in that. It was hard to see, but in those animations, there's quite a range. And partly we were just testing what would it be like to look at that surface. I mean, if they, both, if they were all going to perform acoustically the same or within a reasonable range, then it was how will us, these patterns scale in the space? What can we afford? We had that piece in the criteria, right? You start laser cutting, and laser cutting equals time, like all those lines, all that time. So what could we afford? So there was, the matrix also had an economic piece in it. Um, but I think the biggest driver was, you know, how would that surface read visually if you're this big and, and it's up here? And how would that kind of scale in the space? Um, but there were a lot of different factors. But, you know, in the end, we're, yeah, it's like, was, was number 138 better than number 128? I don't know. <laughs> I can't guarantee that it would be that much better. But this is, I think this is the issue. And so when you're saying, you know, there's so many, so much work that's about performance and performance is about data and information. But at some point you still have to make a decision that's not necessarily, doesn't necessarily have clear answers that, from that information, right? We're, in, we're just interested in how we do this. We don't, we tried to take a, a different project of ours. Last summer we made a summer research research project and we tried to come up with um, a workflow between using a parametric, we turned it into a kind of parametric model working grasshopper and try to create a kind of workflow between what was just input from quantitative information, site information, any, any type of information we could find numbers for and then figure out how we were going to also insert these other qualitative decisions and just tried to track how we, how we can do that, like how do you do that in a project. Let's see. Um, you know, Columbia has, we, it's, it's interesting because we're, I think I said at the beginning, one of the reasons I think we've been so invested in this is also because we've been at Columbia and Columbia had a lot of this digital technology early on and we were working, and I should say we, especially Scott, because he teaches in the grad school that had more of these technologies than the undergrads do in my program. but. Um, so we had the software and we have the students, but we are then limited to like what Columbia had. <laughs> Columbia doesn't have a robot. <laughs> Do you guys have a robot? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dean here doesn't have a robot. Now, so you, you end up, you end up like, you know, they didn't even have a five axis mill. So um, I don't know. I think there's a lot of things. I think more, as much as the technology is also then but that, that just relates to who can you work with, like who do you have, you know, who's available to work with. We started, um, there's a couple projects we're working on now where we're starting to talk to um, people working more in resins and plastics. So it's not so much, not only about the milling or the laser cutting, but in this case the forming and the shaping, which we haven't had much chance to do, which would be really great. So if those projects happen, next lecture. <laughs> yeah. Somebody back there had a hand up. Yeah. You saw our homemade brake press in the, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I guess for the, the next project where there were a lot more complicated coordination. Yeah, those were, yeah, those were not computer bent. I'm trying 
trying to think. The, you're talking about where, like in the ceiling of journalism, where it bent around the, it was bending around the, the um, ceiling beams. Um, the, that, was a, that was not a computerized break. That was just those particular pieces on a break press. Um, but that, and I haven't worked with that much, uh, but that is, I mean, there's so many things like that you could do. Have, do you have experience with that? Yeah. Yeah. Have yeah. Like, you know, oh, yeah. Yeah, I think you can do any, yeah, a lot of that. It's just this is, these projects also aren't of that scale. So the fabricator we're working with doesn't have, the, the two different metal fabricators we spent a lot of time working with, neither of them have that kind of um, equipment. That's also part of the process, is, like I said, is you, sometimes if you have a relationship with a the fabricator, they're willing to work with you and, and be on a team, you then are, that's the equipment you have, right? But yeah, so with the bending though, with, with the platform piece, part of this process of learning from the fabricator was figuring out what gauge metal we could actually work with that would both be structural, but also allow us to bend it, to bend those tabs. We, fold, we bent those tabs by hand to a, certain demand, you know, to a certain angle. And then we perforated the metal to bend it a little bit along a line. We actually wanted to experiment with something that wasn't just two sheets hung equidistant all the way down, but when you start to change that dimension, that's when the tab had to change. And when the tab changed, again, it changed the pattern. So again, it was like, what we were interested in that case was this idea of designing the assembly through the design process. Actually, Scott's working on a, a book. He's editing a book with Berkhauser that will come out, I guess, next year. He's, it's called Designing Design, Designing Assembly, Designing Industry. And really thinking about those different steps, like designing design, about the, the whole, all the software and design processes that start to design your design process and how you work with that, designing assembly, about that, the kind of material, right, that you're working with. And designing industry, thinking about how, what are our relationships to manufacturers and industry and how are we designing a process of working with them. And I think it's an interesting thing they've been doing at Columbia, and he's leading this um, project called Columbia Building Intelligence Project, CBIP. They've been actually study looking at um, totally new models for teaching studio. Our studio is team taught by um, a group of instructors who share, who teach all the students together. I mean, they, they will have their own students, I think, at times as well, but they have all the students together. But they're bringing in, um, um, consultants from all over industry to meet with the students and they have consultants meeting with the studio group um, continually to work with different um, software issues but also all sorts of different consultants coming in to teach to give them critiques and advice on different processes that they're working on it's very interesting and they're in the second year it's a studio and then a seminar one semester studio the other one and then they've been running conferences also around the world working with different industries diff meeting in different parts of the world to talk with their different industries so i think there's i think there's new models it's like idea of collaboration there's lots of models that we could all test and architecture has always been at an amazing place because the way we teach is so um is unique to a lot of other teaching environments and is is often seen as the model, right? Where you work and you, you move from one-on-one -on -one to small groups to large groups. It's very much about a dialogue and all that. But I think there's still, there's still more we can be doing if we're interested in how to move architecture forward and collaborate with industry and with other people. Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple more. Go ahead. Yeah. Parametric modeling doesn't require. Um, because, like the projects that you showed, you know, require a lot of like, mm. laser cutting and things. Are there, are there applications for it where it can help you solve problems that aren't necessarily that? Right. Like, yeah, I don't. I don't know if I have a good example of that. But the project I mentioned, it's actually um, this building. We did this a while ago. This was a, a project for. Um, a new environmental center at Governor's Island. And we were really interested in this project and took it last summer as a research project. What we did is we made the building form parametric. We put that in Grasshopper. 
And we started to say if we had, because we want to find another site for this, so we started to say if we had different site conditions or different amount of program or different, you know, variables, how would this thing, how could this thing adapt to these different conditions? So we took a kind of, um, of a, a kind of diagram of a form and used that and put that in, use that with Grasshopper and then started to, to look at things that were, you know, different types of stair configurations, different types of large space versus small space. It was really interesting. It was very complicated, but it was not about fabrication in this case or perforation or laser cutting. It was actually trying to see, could you do that with something as, as complex as a larger building form. It, it met with big limitations along the way. It was a really interesting experiment and research project. But there's got to be something in the middle of those to answer your question. <laughs> but you should do that. <laughs> yeah? yeah I, I just wanted to thank you also for making the end of the ninth floor of Skimmerhorn a beautiful place. I was actually an art history student. When oh, I was you were? <laughs> and, uh, and you made also those slide cabinets Right. Um, but what struck me about that space in your presentation was also that it's a bit of a mausoleum for the slide. Right? Yeah. It's yeah. A kind of death place <laughs> yeah. Right, for the slide, in addition to being a wonderful conference room and all of the rest. Right. So I wondered if you had any comments about using an incredibly kind of supple digital technology to design the walls uh, for an obsolete technology. Right. Like housing. Right. And, and if there was any kind of interplay between those. Oh, it was a huge discussion. Yeah. It was a huge discussion along the way um, in the, you know, the, with the art history faculty, you can imagine. But the faculty, when we started the pro I, I think if you had, if we had, had started the conversation with them at the time that we had finished the project, it would have probably been a different project already. Because the, the mindset, the first mindset of let's reduce the slide library was a big hurdle for a lot of faculty who didn't believe in a digital projection of their slides, one of the slides, one of the archives, didn't want, you know, to reduce. So that was the first step. And then the next step was once they got that space, they were like, this should be a conference room, this should be a meeting space. <laughs> and they've used, and I think the, the use of the slides inevitably has just gone down anyway. So it is, it's, it's, but you know, it should, it, it's a space that could work for other things. I don't know when they'll ever take that next step though. Yeah. I think that's the, I think that's the question that we're we're interested in also is like when you have all this you have more information that you can use to drive a project so how do you choose what to use and how do you make those decisions and I think that's part of what we're studying in our office like what is our workflow what makes sense here and how do we choose between all that data and what really does matter and how do you in and, and not to over fetishize it as just making interesting things um, and how do you do that responsibly? Like I said, the, the, I think, you know, that, that's a call you would make with any project, right? And any dialogue with a client. But at a certain point, um, there are a lot of things that come into play there. And, and you can't do the type of, you know, the slide library project is pretty unique. But it was also understood by the Department of Art History and the Department of Architecture that this was an experiment for students on campus. So in that case, it, it pushed really, really hard at the design and the technique and the, com and the complexity of the form and the kind of complexity of the process as a, as a research project. We can't do that type of work on a public project, but we can do that on a research project. So I think you have to, you know, you have to luckily we have that spectrum in the office, I would say, but I think that's a really important point right now is how do you make those decisions? How do you take 
you know, these tools and techniques and, and help, have them help your design process. And, that, it, and it only expands, right? It only expands. So you guys have, that's, but that's, that's, you know, those are some of the things you get to do while you're here too, is you get to push them and see where they go. But if you can keep a, res a research agenda in your work, um, whatever that might be, whatever the project allows, you can keep that research agenda, then you can start pushing at some of those questions. But I think it's an, I think it's an open thing for us. It's something we're, we constantly come back and, and ask. An important question, yeah. Okay. Thanks for having me. No, it's great to be here.